uh, Lauren spoke about or her case studies with people that had really kind of made it out globally. So I'm certainly not there. I'm very much on the journey there. So I'm going to talk about the journey and, and lessons learned and lessons to learn. Um, and so it's, it's, it's kind of it's part of the story. I'm, I'm certainly not, not completely <laughs> global yet. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I've got a, a background in, in building and architecture, um, specifically timber buildings. Um, so I've got a passion for all things made of wood. Um, I started the Minima brand in 2012 and initially it was uh, architectural interest really in, in what was becoming possible through advances in technology, particular um, CNC technology and I was seeing what architects in Europe were doing able to, to curve wooden forms and create all sorts of amazing things and not finding any clients for it. In architecture I, I started dabbling in product design and I started off with um, some curved wooden benches that clipped together so I'm, I'm really interested in the technology and and because you can get such fine um, cutting and detailing with CNC, you can you can have really fine joints, so you can make things that clip together. So so that's kind of you know it was kind of a technological interest that kind of d d sort of developed into a range of products. So I, so I, um, in 2013, I'd, I'd made the first couple of lights, and and I suddenly realised there was a business in this. I got a couple of stockists along the way, and we slowly started started building the brand and then in 2014 I decided to put it out there and I did my first exhibition um, at the Designing Darby Expo so that's, and it's quite a, for those of you who've done exhibitions, I'm sure many have, it's quite a big thing, you put yourself out there to criticism and compliments and you spend days chatting to people so it was quite an experience and an amazing one and um, that kind of started the, the route for me and shortly after that I was invited to um, apply for a, a CBI uh, export coaching program um, which was in collaboration with CEDA and the CCDI and I was very fortunate along with about 30 other um, South African designer makers to get accepted onto the program. Um, so in a nutshell um, the CBI it's, it's, it's part of the, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs and it runs a program in third world countries um, in collaboration with that country's agencies, like in this case, like CEDA and the CCDI, um, to assist and develop export um, capacity into the EU. And it does this by extensive um, market research, um, coaching of participants, um, and by representation on some of the large trade shows in Europe, um, for example, uh, Ambienta in, in Frankfurt, uh, and of course, uh, Maison and Obier in, in Paris. And it's been doing this for, for probably 50 years or so. so um, I certainly got to, to, to um, exhibit overseas through help and I can't stress enough the need to get support and, and coaching. Um, it is available and um, getting into the export market without it is a really difficult process. So, um, and there's, there's help available for example the DTI um, export um, marketing assistance through the EMEA program uh, which can be accessed directly or via CEDA or CCDI. So definitely recommended if you're going to go into the global market when one, one does need assistance initially. Um, so why would one want to exhibit at a trade fair? It's, it's, it's really a lot of work, um, but it's essential to get your brand out. Um, of the EU buyers surveyed, 88% said they relied on trade shows to, to source products. The only figure above that, and, and that's what you mentioned, <laughs> was, was inbound buyer emissions. Um, which was the example that um, Chantal showed us of, um, with Source. And then third place comes um, online search. So you obviously you can see there's a, a lot of those are doing both, but it, it just shows that, that you really need to get out there with the product. And then obviously to generate sales, um, short and long term, and it's, it's become more and more long term. Um, trade shows many years ago had this reputation of you'd go there and you, you'd get your orders people would come and they place orders and they place orders for the year but things have changed because of internet and sort of the, the um, local as you call it, I mean everyone's in contact with everyone, people go there, it's, it's really just a meeting place now, um, meeting potential customers in the real world face to face especially as a small brand they expect to see the designer on the stand so you know you've got to be there yourself, they want to ask you about what you're doing and, and why um, and then the orders will 
will come later. And, and, and obviously not, not as it used to be in, you know, years ago where they placed big orders because now you expect it to produce quicker. Um, so it's really just a meeting place. And then of course to test your products and to get feedback, and you do get feedback, good and bad, um, uh, to check out the competition. I mean, products and prices, I mean, it's, you've got to know how you're competing and, 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 and what's happening. And then of course to see trends and most importantly to get inspiration. It's really inspiring. Uh, especially a, a show like Maison. So this year I was, I was fortunate enough to be selected by CBI along with another nine companies um, to exhibit at the September Maison last, last month. So what to expect out of something like this? First of all, the scale. I mean, it is absolutely huge. To, to, to give an example, the Design in Darba Expo would probably fit into maybe that little part of of Hall 1. Um, it would take you a good couple of days to actually walk through the whole trade show. And each hall has got its own very specific product style. So buyers come and they've sort of pre-decided which hall they're going to they're go to. So if you're in the wrong hall, no one's going to necessarily see you. So, you know, you go there and you, you, we're told there's 69,000, well this was last year, there were 69,000 visitors, all trade. 70% um, buyers, so that's sort of retailers, wholesalers, and the other 30% are designers, architects, specifiers, doing restaurants, hotels, and so on. So, you know, when you get there, you're very excited, you think, wow, I've got the whole world's coming to look at my products. Until you start actually looking around yourself, and you realize, well, the whole world's products are here, and you, you, you're in there, you know, amongst the best designers and brands in the world, and you, and you go, okay, I just hope someone even notices me, or even just rec sees my product, because you, you suddenly, you, you, you realize you're such a small fish in such a big sea. So it's, it's a really humbling experience as well. Um, and just some stats there, there were 3,300 brands, 700 of which were there for the first time, including most of, of our group. Um, 59 countries represented. So yeah, really quite an in incredible scale. Um, this was the, the CBI pavilion with the, the 10 South African companies. Uh, myself and my wife Rebecca on, at, at our stand with, with our new lights. And this, these are the other companies um, that were part of our group. Um, you probably recognize some of them or most of them. And then um, the CCDI was there as well in collaboration with Source, and this was their stand. So, trends. <laughs> and, and why are they relevant? Um, so, some designers may be trend resistant and just want to design as they please, and, and I was certainly one of those. I mean, like, with, with the architecture background and designing buildings and houses for people that are going to live in them. I mean, they're telling you what they want. Um, you've got very you know, strict requirements to work to, and I was thinking, well, product design's fantastic. I can just do whatever I please. But um, you do realize quite soon that that's fine if you're an established brand. I mean, for example, Tom Dixon, he's the trendsetter. But the, reali the reality is buyers arrive at these trade shows, they've got, a, they've got a storyboard. They've got certain colors they're looking for. They've got certain textures. They've got certain ideas. and they, they've got to satisfy their customers in their retail store. So they, they, they're going there with the preconceived idea of what they want. And if, if you don't fit in with that in some other way, people are just simply going to walk right past you. So trends are just unfortunately a reality. You do need to, you do need to be aware. You need to know what's going on. Um, and you need to understand your, your, your target um, market, market segment as well. Low, mid-high, mid-high. Like where do you fit in? And um, each of them have got their own trends and consumer behavior. Uh, for example, the Scandi trend was in the sort of mid-high range and it's now become sort of mass market, which, which changes what people are prepared to pay for Scandi design. So it's, it's, you know, it's becoming mass and we're starting to see it, for example, here in our local Mr. Price home and wherever else. Um, so and, and, oh, to get awareness of trends, I mean, you attend talks, um, visit trade fairs, you know, look on Pinterest, Instagram, and then of course, um, all other influences, fashion, movies, pop culture, everything, everything has an influence. So I was asked to just do 
uh, my interpretation of some of the trends that I've seen, and, 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 and I'll talk about some of the highlights. But really, there is so there are so many different um, ranges, segments that if you ask ten people to, to walk through a, sh a big show like Maison and, and come back with their favourites or the trends they spotted, you, you're going to get ten completely different answers. So this is very much my own personal, um, you know, a couple of things that I saw that I really liked. Um, I was really, really, really happy and very uh, obviously pleased to see that wood is still, still strong. And there was some amazing work, um, some Portuguese brands, um, Mitya from Slovenia, um, in lighting as well. And of course, the, the Nordic, uh, the Scandinavian design is still strong. I mean, the Nordic countries are still um, kind of waving the minim minimalist flag very high. And we're also starting to see, like with Mitya, for example, the, the influence of technology, even though it's really subtle, but I mean, those kind of forms and shapes that they're creating is, is digitally driven. Um, and, and so CNC technology, even though it's hand finished, and it's, it's, it's the technology is allowing us to see more of those sort of curved forms and curved shapes. So we're going to see, we're certainly going to see more of that evolving as more companies get to grips with the technology and, and start using it more effectively. So, and then just some other materials. There's still a, a strong trend towards natural, which I was also very pleased about. So, we're seeing bamboo and sort of rattan and, and weaves and a lot of texture. And then, I mean, some of the staples, um, Tom Dixon, the trendsetter, was there again with his still a new range of, of, of copper lights. So, you know, which means copper will still be around for a while. Marble made a, a sort of a new show, and there was a lot of marble in different colours. And then um, there, there's a craft section, which is quite similar to the, what the Design in Darva Expo was, sort of small designers, producers, and there was just some amazing, amazing work there. So this was one of my favourites that I saw, it was just these paper lights, and they were just absolutely amazing. And there was also a lot of really nice ceramics in that section, which unfortunately I don't have any photographs of. Um, and then, what did you say about colour? You ignore colour at your peril. So, <laughs> I just had to, this was just, you know, what we noticed as well. Luckily, we actually got the same colour. <laughs> <laughs> so, kale was very evident. And, and not necessarily in, in products as well, but often in backgrounds, in decoration. And, you know, so it was part of the display. Um, there was this kind of dusty pink, I think you'd call it, yeah, sort of emerging. And, and then indigo, and we're seeing a lot of indigo in products, but then also little highlights, like you'd see a timber, timber product with indigo brace or leg. Or, so those were the three colors that I would have said were the ones that stood out for me. And then Maison every year has a, has a trend theme for the season, and, and, and for this fair it was called House of Games. Um, so these are these are very, in terms of design, they're very conceptual. I mean, as a designer, you, you, know, you walk away from it going, okay, well, what does this mean? I mean, how do I translate this into products? But that's not really the idea. They, they're really just doing something conceptual. And for me, this was just sort of whimsical and, and it created a sense of playfulness, um, perhaps in a, in a world that's troubled. I mean, Europe's in, a, you know, in Paris. I mean, we saw military everywhere. And, you know, it's, it's not a... It's not a very happy free place at the moment. And so I think this was almost a, a kind of response to this, a bit of, a bit of light heart in this, it's, you know, let's play a bit, let's have some fun, let's be whimsical. So there was this huge sort of um, section where they, where they had this um, house of games. And then this was certainly my own highlight and I think a lot of people's highlight at the fair. It was called um, a forest of resonating lamps and it was, it was at the entrance to Hall 7, um, and I think thousands of people must have passed through this, and what it was, was each of these lamps had a sensor on it, so as you walked through it, they responded to you, and so it, it just cre created this most amazing, I don't know if you've seen the movie Avatar, I mean that's kind of the feeling you had, like as you were walking through, lights were lighting up and they were changing colour, and I think they also responded to the amount of people in it, so again, very conceptual, I mean we, we're not seeing any products that that do this yet, but I think it's it's kind of it's kind of designers saying, well, this is a the technology is available, and we will start incorporating it at some point. So you know, expect a you know to to walk into a movie theater and and as you get close to the chair and start sitting, it's going to fold down, or 
you know, all the lights are going to come on. So, so it was, I think it's really just taking the idea that the technology is available, and this is sort of an extreme version of it. Um, so, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, product development and, and some lessons learned and, and, and perhaps some advice. So first of all, there's just so much, there are just so many products. Um, I, I attended a talk by a Dutch designer about a year or two ago called Ineke Hansen, and the one thing she said that really resonated with me, she said, you know, there are so many products in the world, why should anyone buy yours? Like, do you, do you, are you going to make another product? What's the, you know, what's your reason? Um, and because there's so much stuff there, you, you really need to have a clear concept. You know, like, if you're doing lighting, well, then it should just be lighting, and don't have too many different things. Um, so that you, you kind of stand out with, with some clarity. And then, what is your story? I mean, so many people actually come to the center. Well, your products are great, but what's it about? I mean, you know, what are you making it out of? Um, why? Um, wh you know, what sort of labor do you employ? I mean, where, where do they come from? Um, you know, so, so the story is really important. And there were, there were a couple of customers that came around, and they were, they were as interested in the story as in the, as in the product. Um, and particularly if, you, if you're exporting something, because someone could say, well, I, I love your, your chair, but I can get one that's made in Italy down the road. I mean, why are we going to put your chair on a, in a container and send it up from South Africa? They're actually buying into the, into the story if you've got a good one. Um, and then, obviously, design, innovation, um, craftsmanship and quality. And, and quality has, is actually not even a selling point anymore. No one's going to buy your product because it's got better quality than the next one. It's actually just a given. Without uh, the minute you go into the sort of international market without top quality, um, it's just not even, not even an option. And then values, um, green products, sustainability, particularly in the sort of mid and, and mid-high market. I think once one gets into the top end, the sort of brands, um, sustainability, certainly I didn't see any, any of it. I mean, it's marble and it's granite and it's heavy things and no one really seems to care. But, but in the sort of, in the mid-high, mid-range, people, people care and, um, and they want to know about your products. You know, if, if it's timber, is it FSC certified? How, you know, how was it, was it sustainably harvested? Um, you know, and then pricing. I mean, pricing is, is actually a minefield. I mean, so South African products, I mean, we, we kind of think because we're in rands and we're going to be getting euros, we think, oh, wow, this is going to be fantastic. Our products are going to be well priced. But the, the, the truth of the matter is they're not. We're actually, we're actually quite expensive, and South African design products are seen as being expensive. Um, and particularly through, because of the distribution. So, for example, if, you, if you're selling directly to a retailer, the price on the shelf at the end of the day is going to be about three times your wholesale price. Um, once all the shipping has been taken into account, the, 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 the import duties, the tax on that side. So, you know, you've got to look at your product and go, well, what's it selling for in a retail store in Paris or wherever? And if it's going for 300 euros, well, that's, your, you can't be at more than 100 because that's what's going to happen. And if you're going through, through a distributor, a wholesale distributor, that figure becomes times five. Um, so, and the customers, you know, so you, there's a lot of negotiation that goes on. And then, of course, there's volume. And, and you, get, you get asked questions that, you know, we don't normally have to, like someone here in, at Sarkta or 100% Design would say, well, could we order 10 or 20 from you? And there you'll get a question, look, we'd like to place an order for 150, please, per month, but not at the price that you're asking. I mean, that's crazy. You, you've got a half your price. So you suddenly, that's a whole lot of things that you really learn along the way. So you've got to go there prepared. For a lot of things, um, and then there's logistics and freight. Uh, you know, you'll you'll get the question of, okay, if I love your product, but what's it going to cost delivered to Copenhagen? Um, so you need to have your your freight charges worked out. You know, through your shipping agent before you go. So you know, if you order 10, 20, is it? In, in my particular case, it's it's my products are flat pack. Um, so at the moment, I'm trying to find someone on that side to actually do the assembly so that I can reduce the the freight costs. So there's a lot of a lot of things to learn and a lot that's very different to, um, to the local market. So your export product range, um, do, does one select from your, your current range or do you develop something specific for, for, the, for the overseas market? In my case, my local products, you know, I kind of came along with a Scandi look and then knowing that the Scandi thing was sort of becoming more mass, I had to start 
thinking differently, um, yeah, the, 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 the looking for something more African, more South African. So I started looking at, at, at patterns and I sort of took the idea of a shwe shwe pattern and started playing with it and, and, and simplifying it and converting it into something that could be made into into a light and we developed, we, I then wanted to use African timbers so I started looking at um, African mahogany veneers and we, we started laminating veneers together to form a, a flexi ply and then we came up with the light in the middle. So that was the product that I, that I took over. Uh, we ended up making it out of bamboo as well which was also well received. And then I, because I'd now developed the bamboo veneers, um, we st I sort of took the original concept and then we started adding veneers and we got something again that I think has got a bit of a African feel, no one has seen anything else like it, so it was also well received. But as I said, this is now just part of the journey, so now, now we're into the next stage and all the negotiations and so on. So finding the sweet spot um, with your product. The first thing is, I mean, it's got to be your passion. You're going to put so much work into it and so many hours, it may as well be an absolute passion. Um, and then what are you good at? And then you've got to find a marketable product, a marketable product at the right price that people are going to buy it for and it's got to fit into the trends and what the market wants. And if you can get those three together, well, that's your sweet spot. And of course your story, because everybody's going to ask, what is your story and why have you done this? So that's it for me. Thank you. I'll leave you with another photograph of uh, my favorite installation there. Thank you very much.